Okay, thank you very much. First of all, a great many thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be back at Help Up after a long absence, and it's a privilege to talk to such an audience. So thank you very much for having invited me here. Um, what I'm going to try to do today is foreground something which I'm afraid is too often sort of avoided, probably for diplomatic reasons, probably because of circumstances in which discussions take place, and which is that behind what has happened in the evolution of open access stand a lot of really deep conflicts which are not often put to the, to the, to the fore and are not discussed as they should be. And I'm going to try and show what some of these conflicts are this morning, and I'm going to uh, try to show that how these conflicts have really contributed to shaping the situation in which we are. And if I succeed in doing that, we may have some ideas of where we should stress our efforts, where we should try and push uh, our, uh, our objectives in order to be as efficient as possible if we want to really work in favor of open access. I've changed the title slightly because it's going to be, uh, in effect, the subtext and the kind of left-hand accompaniment of this whole thing, the theme of competition. One strong point I'm going to try to make today is that the factor of competition is much more important than we generally uh, give it uh, as importance, and that we, it is shaping in many, many ways a lot of the things that are being done or that we are doing, and they are actually uh, warping strongly some of the deep objectives of what science and scholarship are all about. So without further ado, let me go with a little semi, a little semi theoretical introduction. I think to unpack this whole slew of questions, which is difficult and, and a bit confused at times, it's interesting to, to uh, parcel out pick out the, the uh, various perspectives that can be uh, uh, identified in this regard. And I identify three of them. One of them is very simple. It's the basic sociology of both creators and users of documents. So, you know, are we in a university? Are we in a company? Are we, uh, are we doing this for military reasons? Are we doing this for um, religious reasons or whatever, that would be the sociology of, of creators and users. The second one is borrowed from D.F. Mackenzie, the sociology of texts actually in his vocabulary. I changed it to documents to extend the, the field. Uh, the sociology of documents really tries to give meaning to the text by looking at the process through which they come to be. In other words, when you produce a text, you already give meaning to the text by the way in which you're trying to produce the text. And I think that's a very important uh, sort of thing to keep in mind. And finally, documents themselves create a sort of sociology, which I call in this case a society as a sort of a veiled tribute to Minsky, uh, the Society of Minds. Uh, the, uh, the idea there is to say that all documents maintain some sort of obvious or latent uh, relationship to other kinds of documents. So we have now these three perspectives uh, that I would like, uh, I would ask you to keep in mind as we move through this uh, presentation. Now, just to give you an example of what it can mean is the well-known, the well-known picture, very well-known picture of Ramelli's wheel. Now, if you look at the sociology of users and producers, look at this picture quite carefully and you get already a number of interesting insights. Look, for example, at the door with three bolts on it. This is not the kind of practice of documents that is meant to be done in a big group. It's done very individualist, in a very individualistic manner and uh, in a very, I would say, uh, elitist manner. The man himself, I don't know if you would dress like that when you do work in the library, but I certainly would not wear the hat, personally. Um, but again, it shows the social status of this individual. And you have there, at the same time, a latent description of what happens when cod codices are printed and what you want to do with them. Unlike, unlike manuscripts, in which you really want to follow them in their generational uh, production, 
uh, here you want to put codices in relationship with each other in order to achieve a synthesis or a new series of perspective that is coming from the bringing together of these particular books. The wheel, essentially, and uh, we'll, we'll see a modern equivalent of that a bit later, the wheel, in, in effect, is a kind of mechanical uh, prop for a, a desire toward something like a hypertext. You have that in there. If you look at the uh, 17th century uh, printing press, there again you see the, the whole social makeup that comes from the, um, the, the, uh, the desire to produce books. And I'd like to point out in particular the very first person who is composing the page, but also he's the only one who can wear some sort of weapon. The status is in there. There, is, there are really different levels of society in this, in this uh, shop, and it reveals that the text itself is circulating through uh, social stratification models and through power re relationships. Just wanted to bring that up through that picture. Now with the new technologies, you have very funny things happening, like a new sociology of togetherness, which shows a bunch of people who are in the same space-time, apparently, but actually are not. They are in their own space-time. They are all sitting or standing next to each other, but lost in some sort of relationship with other people which have nothing to do with the, the people next, to, uh, next to, uh, to them. When I was looking for that picture, I found one which I almost brought, but I said I don't know how it would fly. It was a rather funny picture of a couple in bed with a man, the man sleeping and the woman calling somebody or texting to somebody while we're checking if the husband or companion uh, is really asleep or not. Um, that was, I thought, a very good way to dissociate physical space-time from uh, the uh, communicational space-time. New sociology of documents, you produce documents differently nowadays. Perhaps you have to be a perfect idiot to do it, but it's uh, uh, one of the ways to approach the production of text, very different from our shop. And I don't need to wear a knife around my, my belt to do it, to demonstrate my social status. Again, differences with different periods. And finally, the hypertext itself, I'm not going to delve on that, but it's a really a new society of documents. And the web, of course, has become a sort of overarching universe of, uh, for that society of documents which, within which we live nowadays. This is probably the greatest transformation that we've gone through uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. So now to go into really the meat of my, my topic, I really think that we should look at how various actors uh, really uh, sort out these things from their perspective. So they have these three kind of approaches to documents. And if you're in a certain locus, certain place in society, how do you look at these various things? And just to, to start the things off, we'll start with my favorite crowd, the ones I like most, the one I love, the one I, well, Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, and the, the big commercial publishers, the one I like to call the public oligarchs. So let's look at the sociology of documents from their point of view. When they address researchers from that perspective, they'll say something like, give me your text, all your rights, and I will give you the world. And of course, as I write down here, it reminds you perhaps of a certain trip on the temple of Jerusalem with the, with the devil, and uh, if you adore me, I'll give you the world. Uh, so researchers who give me your time and expertise to do the peer review. Uh, this is what the publisher is going to ask to the sociology uh, of documents. That's how these documents are produced. That's how th there is an inherent power relationship which is behind the, the production of these things. And there are, of course, uh, economic factors that you all know about. I'll, I'll come back to that. If they address librarians, by, by contrast, they'll say, librarians give us undisclosed, undisclosed confidential, confidential clauses, uh, amounts of money, and I will give you, again, the world. Big deal. And then uh, we librarians, well, you know, we shall take care of the collections. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Preservation, let us do that as well. Anyway, only our licensing access to these things nowadays. You don't own that stuff. And we'll do much of the indexing. Perhaps one day we'll do all of the indexing. And the last part is, librarians, perhaps after all, we don't really need you. 
They, I think they do for one simple and important reason, which they don't like to say, and that is, we do need you because that way the researchers don't know how much you pay. You know? So they are not worried about this part of the, of the deal. And then in the third version of the sociology of documents, the funders, and then, oh, unexpected visit there. Who are they? Well, funders, you're here now to come and give us some money. We never expected that. I remember, I remember uh, Dirk Hank, the president, uh, I think still president, CEO of Springer Nature, uh, uh, who before was the CEO of Elsevier. This fellow really knows the score. Uh, this was in Frankfurt at the book fair, and uh, he was explaining in front of me and others how surprised he had found that he could perhaps develop a new revenue stream from the funders. Never thought the funders would ever come into paying the publishers. But lo and behold, through APCs and through these kinds of business models, the funders were uh, brought into uh, the, the story and were reinforcing the uh, business model of the publishers. So, we never expected any revenues from you. Thank you so much, ever so much. And thank you for supporting open access at any cost. And this brings me to an important element of this argument. Open access is a great thing, and I'll be the last person not to say that. But when you start pushing open access in any form at any cost, without thinking about the consequences of both the form and the way in which you're pushing open access, you end up with a horror story. And that's where we have to be extremely careful not to be caught by words which seem and sound like the words we like to use, but actually lead us in directions we do not want to, to use. So, at any cost, at any cost. And then, of course, the hidden but most important element of all these, uh, of the interloc interlocutors of uh, the big publishers, the investors. Don't forget that many of these international companies are more publicly traded uh, companies. And they are, uh, of course, uh, very sensitive to the, the life of their stock and the way those stock evolve. So they go to the investors and say, we guarantee you a most sustainable, that's a word that publishers like to use, a most sustainable, it really means profitable, uh, return on investment. If I'd been among Conocenti, I would have called that an ROI because you don't say return on investment anymore, you just say ROI. And then we can guarantee this because we know how to manage and control all the researchers. We have the impact factor and we even know even how to work it. You know, the impact factors have been known to be manipulated and we know how to work it. So we know to do that because we've been able to keep the journals as the pivot of the whole system. In fact, the journals have become the logos of the whole research and knowledge creation process. They are the scientific Armani, Voss, Vuitton, and the rest of it. And with this system of journals and impact factor, we've managed to make people compete, everybody compete about against everybody else. The researchers see that almost as a necessity. They have to compete, they have to compete, they have to compete for anything, for whatever. And even better, we now even have managed to encroach the very world of knowledge and of production of knowledge by participating in the creation of researcher hierarchies. For example, when we have a new journal, we can nominate, we create a new journal, we own that journal, we can create an editorial board, and we can call to that editorial board the, peop the people we want, and thereby we offer these people a sort of academic promotion. You know that inside a university, being the editor of a journal is not something that is uh, totally neglected, far from it. It's important. So we can do that. And there is a very good case that illustrates that particularly starkly or recently. You may have heard, many of you I know have, uh, you may have heard about the spat that surrounded the journal from Elsevier called Ling um, Lingua. And you know that the editorial board um, resigned en masse uh, 
uh, for, to, to protest the fact that Elsevier did not want to go in the direction that they as editors were wishing to see their scholarly journal go. But Elsevier owned the title. So the only th thing they could do was to, to, to resign en masse. But even that uh, didn't give the results, I think, that they were hoping for. They did create another journal called Glossa, which for the moment is a, a relatively unknown uh, entity except for the publicity that has surrounded the spat, but that will be forgotten very quickly. On the blogs and in the lists, you heard discussions saying, oh, well, Elsevier is going to have a tough time now recruiting a new editorial board for their journal. Lo and behold, go in their site and look at the journal. The, the new editorial board is bigger than the old one. The new editorial board is more geographically varied than the old one. And I can just see Elsevier saying to the community of linguists, we have a much better editorial board now. It's really worldwide, it's global. We have people from Asia, we have people from Latin America, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, uh, and we, we still have the journal and it has a good impact factor. These guys have nothing. And so, you know, when, when you go into uh, this sort of zone that shows the penetration of the commercial interest inside the academic sphere, in the research sphere, you start seeing some very, very strange, uh, I would say, warpings and uh, weavings of, of the texture of knowledge. This is the stock of Elsevier as it has evolved in the last five years very predictable. If you, I'm sorry, this is the only free investment advice I'm going to give you today. If you want more, you write to me, I'll send you my bill. Okay? Uh, the, the, uh, you see what's happening. And if, you, if you could read, I don't think it's very clear, but they also have a dividend which is somewhere around 2.6%. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sure thing. Piketty come to the rescue. We have they are a good example of how people who are at a certain level of wealth can no longer lose and are doing very well. Thank you. Now, if we go to not just the, the uh, sociology documents, if you go to the Society of Documents, how do publishers like these big international publishers address these questions? Users, that is all of us, researchers, we shall invent and implement a society of documents that will keep you the user in the net. Actually, actually in the early days of the net, there was a, a, a word for that. They used to call that by a series of links that people would follow. They used to call that creating an attractor. And people would move inside the web and keep on falling into the same kind of categories. And funnily enough, I don't know if you know what group invented that sort of thing, but it was the pornography industry. So once you hit one pornography site, it was very hard to get out of the pornography sites if you just kept on clicking. You'd better really shut the, the whole web, uh, uh, the, the, your, your Firefox or your whatever, and, uh, and start all over again. Creators, that is, we as authors, your text is going to be part of our society of text. Now, if you go, for example, in Science Direct, it's quite amusing to see how once you find and identify an article, they point you immediately to articles that may be interesting to you. And it is an interesting service they provide because, indeed, you discover things that way, and I've discovered things that way. But the point is that in an, an economy of attention, when your time is limited and you're being subtly directed like that, towards the articles that are part of, the, of this particular society of texts, what you end up doing is making people confuse that society of texts with, with the whole world. So in effect, what you, you end up with is a, a sort of warped vision again of the research landscape. You think you've done your heuristics correctly. What you've done really is really exploited well the uh, works that a particular publisher offers you and of course, you're going to preferentially read those works, which will also lead to probably more citations, which and then you can continue the argument. We're back to the impact factor. We're back to the competition. We're back to the, the, that story. So the end part of all this is really users, creators. We want you to mistake our world for the whole world. We want you to think that when you're in the shopping mall, 
there is nothing else outside the shopping mall. And the, the publishers are not the only one to do that. We've heard a, a few whiffs of that yesterday. Um, the Web of Science is doing the same thing. Scopus is doing the same thing. These, in those cases, these tools, behind the pretext of trying to identify what they call core science, which is a myth if you consider that core science cannot be distinguished by a hard barrier from non-core science. It's a gradient. What's important and not important in science is a gradient. Now, where do you draw the line? Pretty arbitrary. Why do you draw a line? Because it allows you to exclude. Why do you want to exclude? Because it gives you a lot of power. We heard about the case of Cielo, which finally managed to get half of its articles, uh, journals, I mean, inside uh, the Web of Science, by paying, by the way, in a sort of annex to Web of Science. And after years and years and years of trying to get into the Web of Science to be viewed, and suddenly people realize that Cielo exists. We heard, uh, you know, we, we heard that yesterday. So the, the, the confusion of a particular world for the whole world is very much part of this, uh, of this strategy, and it is extremely powerful. There are more than 27,000 journals in the world, I can assure you. You just go into Latin Dex for Latin America, and, uh, and these are mostly journals that you'll never see in the Web of Science or in, um, in Scopus. And uh, you'll find there over 8,000 journals just for Latin America and mainly in the social sciences. So, you know, saying that Latin America would have uh, already one third of what has been uh, indexed in the big indices is really something that uh, truly should be, uh, should be examined a bit more closely. So let's uh, look at also at how these uh, publishers look at journals and uh, with regard to users and creators. Journals for us, they would say, they no longer deal with communities. They are meant really to make you compete. You have to sort of compete. It's like, it's a kind of minor grant. If you go for a grant, you compete for the grant. If you go to submit an article, you're competing for being inside the, the article. It's gone so far now that the, the more recently, nature, nature is probably one of the very good examples of that. They've done now a way of cascading the journals in their collection. So that if you're refused in the top, so-called top tier, then your article is automatically submitted below, but the reviews are already done. So the cost of the review is already taken on. And then you keep on going down until some level accepts your, journal, your article and then it's published and uh, at some level of rejection. So, you know, we, if that's not a, a dire form of competition, I don't know what it is. We want to create hierarchies. The cascading system is a pure hierarchical system. We rank and rank and rank. In fact, we live only to rank. We rank all the time. And we rank because having the power to rank is the way to make you do what we want you to do. That's, uh, that's, that's the key of the whole thing. And the whole point of all this is that because we own the journals, we drive that competition through the device of the journals. So of course there is this historical legacy of journals. It's the way to go through uh, a, an object which is familiar to people. But when we, we enter into the world of, of the, digital, uh, the digital world, I think we, should be, we would be well advised to rethink very deeply, very thoroughly, very profoundly what a journal is and what do we mean by a journal and do we really need a journal? Maybe a journal is actually nothing more than an aggregate of functions or services that, uh, that is embodied in the, in the familiar uh, bundling of articles. Maybe with the digital world, we can revisit each one of these functions and see if we can perhaps unbundle them and re perhaps bundle some of them in a different way, in a different, uh, with different objectives. So the sociology uh, of users and creators from the perspective of the big publishers, it's a star system. It comes from Hollywood and it turns into that. And that's what uh, really we're trying to do. And this is, when you think of science, it's a little bit silly. I mean, suppose you want to drive a society. Let's say a, a government decides to 
organize a society on the basis of the Hollywood principle. And everybody is competing to become a star in that society. I'm not sure that would do, it would make an extremely good society. But you can imagine the amount of competition there would be for any, any, uh, any shooting of any scene that would eff effectively address itself to the whole population. Well, in the case of, of science, most of science is done in a very competent, serious, quality assured way, but it's not a star system. You do your measurements in your lab, you modestly but solidly publish the results, and this is going to go into the, 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 the great archive and the great conversation of science in order to bring about the possibility of going a bit further and moving along. I fully and personally fully subscribe to the Ortega hypothesis that most of science is done in non stellar way, but rather done in very competent, serious, but modest ways. We are all, after all, more or less normal people who do our best to contribute to a very interesting activity which has been designed in the 17th century, to, in which can be summarized as being the invention of distributed intelligence. But distributed intelligence doesn't need stars, it just needs good nodes in the network of those who are distributed in this fashion. And we should, we should remember that as we go into the analysis of uh, scientific publishing. So, against this kind of vision, I'm asking what do researchers, what do librarians, what do funders say? Are they on the same page or do they have a different vision? And of course my thesis is that their vision is going to be, is going to be extremely, extremely different. Now, what uh, researchers really want is participation in what I call the great conversation. They want to be able to produce things and have it put in such a, a way inside the archive of the group that does that sort of work so that it can be found, it can be used and can be reused and it can help other people go further. If every time you want to climb on the shoulders of a giant, you have to pay a fee to do so, I think you're going to avoid climbing the shoulders of the giant quite often. Or perhaps you would like to, but you just cannot which is silly because then what we're doing is saying that in the grand human, human endeavor of creating a distributed intelligence system, uh, we are actually denying the possibility of participating for the great majority of the human population. That's a weird thing, isn't it? I mean, do we want to make of science an elitist and purely competitive system? That's what I'm asking. We want that instead. The metaphor here is clear. We're all around the round table and we discuss and we know who is doing what more or less and we try and find what the others are doing and we try to do our little thing and we try to bring our little break to the edifice, the common edifice. There is a notion of commons there which is very important. Knowledge as a commons and, and uh, as a common. And, and I think that's the image we should keep in mind rather than the Olympic game of the minds that the publishers are trying to impose on us. I would argue that researchers generally prefer, like better to cooperate than they're doing anything else. They compete only under very special uh, circumstances. When Pauling and Watson, Crick's, Watson and Crick's were competing about the DNA structure, that was a very peculiar moment in their lives of all three of them. Normally, those three people would probably would have been sharing uh, a lot of information because they would not have felt that they, they, they were in a situation where perhaps being the first describing the structure of DNA might be really very, very visible and important. There are moments like that. I'm not discounting the importance of co competition at certain moments of science. The problem is that those moments of science are the spectacular moments of science. And I really put the line on the spectacular it becomes a spectacle. And at that point, at that point, we tend to appreciate or interpret the whole of science as if it were just a big reality show. Well, we've got Trump already. We don't need that. that uh, I, we don't have to add this kind of vision for science, you know. Um, researchers, what do they want in their society of text? They want seamless a seamless society of text. They want to be able to navigate. 
there, there was a very interesting work done recently by a team centered around Bruno Latour in Paris uh, about the monadic vision, the monadic vision of, uh, of science. And uh, it, it showed that in effect what we are, all of us are nodes in networks and what we, we have is like a monad, we have a, a perspective of the whole world but our perspective is very much tied to our uh, particular position in the network. And what we want to do is navigate that knowledge and encounter other perspectives in order to build, work, evolve our own perspectives. That's really what is going on. Competing is like being all by yourself. You're sitting in your, like this uh, gentleman with a Ramelli's wheel, you put your three bolts on the door, your hat on your head, and you, and you go on, you go on uh, doing your work all by yourself because you want to be the great author. And then, of course, we could do, I could do a whole riff about the author function uh, to show that it, too, is a very, very questionable um, uh, notion, which is also largely a product of print and the commercial side of print. The documents that we work as a system of distributed intelligence are meant to feed the great conversation. Let's put the priorities in the right thing. When we, when we produce documents, we are contributing to the great conversation of knowledge production. The knowledge production system is not there to feed the publishers. It's, it never was meant for that purpose. So when we, we see this, the system working now the other way, economically speaking, uh, we, we, we can start asking ourselves if there is not something amiss. Librarians, what do they want? Well, I think one way to characterize their work is that they bring the links between the local conversation, the, their own constituency, and the general grand conversation, which, by the way, brings a a, an issue which uh, I find uh, I find uh, a bit puzzling, and uh, all my apologies to my librarian friends in the room, and uh, including my wife if she were here, since she's a librarian herself. Uh, it's why have not the librarians worked more at creating the local community, at structuring the local community, at organizing. Uh, uh, links between people of their constituency so as to make them realize that, uh, oh, there's someone in my institution that does work that's, that is of interest to me. Why isn't that happening? I mean, I, I, I find it very amusing that the, most, the best way to meet people from your own university is by going to a congress. Maybe you've had that experience. Uh, you go 5,000 kilometers away, you meet someone from your university whom you didn't know, you speak to each other because you're from the same university, tribal reaction, and then you say, what do you do? Oh my God, you too do that. Why didn't we ever talk to each other? Well, I think librarians should do something about that. And with text mining and so forth in the, in the repositories, it would be quite easy to create families and clusters of texts, which would then could be referred back to the authors and tell to the authors, you know, these people are doing things which are, although in different disciplines and on different topics, are using the same forms of reasoning or the same form of tools or whatever, and maybe you'd find some interest in, in uh, identifying these people. And instead of spending your attention time in science, inside Science Direct, you might want to reinforce the weaving of the intellectual community of your own university. And then, of course, the librarians can do that with other universities, push on, push on to the next level, and then you end up having a weaving of the communities uh, done from bottom up through this kind of mental mechanism. Funders like to support and orient or focus the great conversation. That's really what they're trying to do. They give money for people to do research on certain topics, or sometimes it's undefined topics. They want to support the great conversation for whatever reason they do that. Uh, they do try to influence what you might call science policy to some extent, sometimes to a large extent, but uh, fundamentally they want to go into the great conversation. And that, that I think, uh, is something that should be kept in mind as well, and I'm going to come back to them very shortly. So, what I'm saying is that of all my, my participants, what people sometimes call 
stakeholders. I don't like very much the term stakeholders because it papers over the fact that the stakes are quite different from one, one actor to the next. You know. uh, so uh, the actors that I, I find in my looking around inside the, uh, the grand conversation or the great conversation, and you find that researchers, librarians, and funders don't exactly pursue the same objectives, don't do the same things, but more or less share a lot together, including the values. And they do have similar, all the same, similar objectives. One of them is that their intent of being uh, behind the project of a distributed intelligence system called science or the production of knowledge. So the question then becomes, how do we align a rich strong and inclusive, not exclusive, inclusive system, communication system, with the needs of researchers and funders. When I insist on the inclusive, it is because whether you use a, 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 pay, a, pay, a, a pay wall, a toll road to, to limit access to things, or you use a article uh, processing charges uh, to, to finance the journals, in the new so-called APC Gold um, system, uh, you are excluding one way or another. I think Gerald will tell us more about that later today. But, um, and I think it's important to say it. Uh, what we want is strong and inclusive and rich, of course, communication system. How can we do it? Uh, how do we align that with the needs of researchers and funders? And I think there, there is a very important step. The librarians are there very, very, uh, in a very, very, I would say, strategic location at a moment when it is really useful for them to discover such a strategic location. Why am I saying this? Refer back to my remark by the publishers who said, saying, well, maybe the librarians, we don't really need you very much anymore, except as a kind of shield for the economic pain of the, uh, of the journals. Well, it's true. I mean, look at what's happened in the last 30 years. With the licensing system, the librarians don't own what they are paying for. Uh, with the, uh, the uh, licensing system, the librarian, instead of greeting people inside the building, and it used to be the tradition of that profession, very generous profession, to more or less accept, in most cases, most of the people inside the building. Uh, now they have to come contrary to uh, give passwords and let people very precisely use that only if they belong to a very well-defined form of community. You know all about this. Uh, collections, how do you design your collection with big deals? Uh, preservation, well, if you have access only and the stuff is preserved on the, on the, on the computers of Elsevier, Wiley, or Springer, Na Springer Nature, Unless in the rare cases, there are rare cases in which libraries insist on storing the stuff locally, but they are not the majority by a long shot. So that too, preservation, it seems to be left aside. So you might say, by the way, uh, uh, is it that libraries are turning into book museums? In Montreal, the present librarian, um, that's going to hit me back sometime, but. Uh, I'll say it anyway, uh, has decided that uh, she wanted a big project as part of her mandate in the, in the, at McGill. And uh, the big project is to bury, at the cost of $165 million, all the, all the books on the ground on the campus of McGill. Uh, what she has not realized, which is purely local, is that uh, McGill is on the slope of a hill, and there are a lot of underground streams, which is wonderful for books, as you all know. So she's trying to essentially do what librarians perhaps are called to do right now if they don't react, which is you are the barriers of books. You are the barriers of books. After all, we're in the digital age. You know, I, we were joking this morning, by the way, uh, Gerald Beasley and myself looking at the Brazilian uh, meeting which had for a theme, uh, building the digital bridges. And I said to Gerald, would you cross such a bridge? And uh, but it's, <laughs> I'll let you. Uh, uh, meditate on this question. No, librarians really have to, to invent themselves on a, new, on, a new, uh, on a new position. And I'm suggesting here one very simple one. I think librarians have got to become a central piece of a new publishing system for 
uh, for the scientific and scholarly communities. Librarians are uniquely positioned to start that, and some have already started, of course. I mean, I'm not saying anything new that, I'm just saying and insisting that those who are not yet convinced by that should quickly adopt that and develop that. And in so doing, not do it as an, individ an individual library. Libraries also have to shed the notion that they are individual, individualized silos of knowledge. They are nodes in the network too. They should create publishing systems as networks. And the networks should be constituted on the basis of various logics, which could be the regional logic, national logic, but also thematic logic, or a way of organizing knowledge, whatever. The beauty of the digital world is that once you have the tools in place, you can always re-network them and repackage them to achieve a different kind of objective. That's the beauty of this very flexible world we're entering into. Let's adopt it. Let's not be caught into provincial um, steeple-gazing uh, psychologies of old. Funders, it seems to me, are also crucial. Like libraries, they do have access to some funds. Sometimes uh, those funds are being spent in funny ways, in both cases. APCs, for example. I'm strongly against the use of library funds for APCs, and I don't think that uh, funders should get into the business of paying for APCs. That makes no sense at all. I prefer eLife, if to take an example. And much better. That's the way to do. But the, the important thing for the funders, since they are in the business of funding research, is by is demonstrating by their actions that the publishing phase of research is not a separate phase of research. It is part of research. And therefore, there is no reason to treat it economically and financially on basis different from that of research itself. Now, I'll remind you one thing which I think people forget way too often, again with this use of vocabulary called sustainability and the rest of it. I would, I would argue that since the creation of the Royal Society in London, and probably way before that, maybe the, maybe the observatory of Tycho Brahe in, Vin, in the island of Vin, in uh, um, Niels, I, I apologize for the pronunciation, uh, the, uh, in Denmark, um, the project of scientific research has been both costly, very costly, and has never been sustainable in the traditional terms of, of sustainability. It's always been subsidized. Do you know in your research that's not subsidized? The silence is eloquent, I would say. Perhaps you don't feel entitled to speaking right now, but I do give you the permission to speak if you want to. Uh, research, research is not sustainable. Now, if you say that the publishing phase of research is an integral part of research, why should you ask of that little part of research, which costs only 1% anyway of the cost of research itself, why would you ask of that to be so-called sustainable? Especially when sustainability in the, in, the, uh, in the discourse of the publishers, the big commercial publishers look at the reaction to the Amsterdam Declaration recently by SDM uh, when they use the word sustainability really to disguise the word profitability. Now, I gave you my investor's advice. You know it. You may follow it if you want. It's a good advice. I, I can guarantee that. I don't own any of this stuff. Um, I should, perhaps. Um, at least I would get the annual reports automatically. That would be a good thing. Maybe I should buy one stuff. Um, so, does this mean we should get rid of publishers now that we have uh, resuscitated the librarians? Um, well, no, I don't think publishers are completely useless. Of course not. But maybe we could locate them with regard to the whole scientific project in ways which are, let me put it in a very, very general way, not terribly, not terribly informative way, but in a, in a more civilized manner. But the model I would use is that of the companies that sell scientific instruments. The companies that sell scientific instruments enter in relationship with the scientific community in ways which are commercial, which sell services and, and, and objects and all that. And there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong, wrong with that because that form of commercial transaction does not affect 
the workings, the workings of the, the grand conversation of science and knowledge. It's simply a thing that the grand conversation needs, and it finds the way to finance that generally through subsidies, and it gets the right stuff. Electron microscope, uh, CERN's uh, Hadron Collider, which is pretty cheap, pretty expensive, rather. And uh, yeah, it's not very cheap. And uh, you know, all the great instruments and tools <clears throat> of science, but also the myriads, <clears throat> the myriads of labs all over the world which use all of them, all kinds of instruments, bought commercially. Now, if publishers were starting to sell services and enter in a relationship with the grand conversation on that basis, without trying to interfere with the workings of the, of the grand conversation itself, I think we would have a, lot, a much healthier system. So yes, publishers have certain skills. Yes, they can be useful. Let us the researchers decide when we need their services, let, not, let us not be imposed upon by these publishers. But to, to do that, again I go back to my main theme, we have to relocate competition in its rightful place. And there again, exactly like publishers, I'm not saying there should never be any competition. But take a classroom in a secondary school. 30, 35 kids in the, in the classroom. <clears throat> they have put more or less, you know, that they are the, 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 the very good, the good, the fairly good, the good, and the bad ones. You know, you, you know, you know more, more or less the stratification that goes there. You don't have really to rank them strictly. Uh, among the bad, this is the baddest, <laughs> so to speak, the worst. No, you just, what you need is that those, those kids really need help. These could do some help. These are starting to do okay, and then you go on like that. In a classroom of that kind, when you talk about the valedictorian, uh, <clears throat> or the prix d'excellence in, in French schools and equivalent in other countries, you know very well that in such a school, you have three, four kids in the whole class that really aspire to being the valedictorian or the or the winner of the Prix d'Excellence and so on. You know that. We've all lived that. We know when we can compete, we know when we cannot. The basic function of the school is to train people with competence and, and assuredness in what they are learning. But we like also to identify a couple champions once in a while because, you know, this creates an extra stimulus for a special category of students. And you, it's true that for some of us, in some, some moments when you are in a comp competing situation, you really give the best you can. And that I think is very useful, and I think we should do that. The main competition in any case we should do should not be against others, it should be against ourselves. It's really, it seems to me, the, the fundamental lesson of all of this. But you can put a bit of competition here and there. So having prizes in science, including the Nobel Prize, having uh, you know, forms of special recognition for uh, particular special achievements, fine. But don't, don't, don't create a system in which you're going to manage everything from A to Z uh, with, <clears throat> with competition. Now imagine a country that would want to improve the health of, his, of, of that country by deciding that they're going to create the best Olympic team in the, in the world. So they start having everybody in the country starting to train for sprint, for hunt, jumping and all that. And they start doing round robin thing to eliminate people. Within two or three round robin turns, most people have been eliminated and don't care anymore. They, they've been disgusted by physical education and physical activity and go back to smoking, drinking and lying on their couch with their potato chips. Uh, and, the, and then at the end you do have, because you've done a, a, a broad selection process, you have managed to get perhaps the best Olympic team in the world. But do you think that uh, that best Olympic team in the world is going to convince the rest of the world that your population is the healthiest in the world? I don't think so. Yet that's what we're doing with, uh, with, uh, with science. And for those of, you, those of you who are tempted by the Darwinian argument, remember that these arguments, as we read them most of the time, take Darwin upside down. When you have a, 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 a group of antelopes being hunted by a lion, Darwinian selection is not trying to identify the fastest antelope, it's trying to identify the slowest. 
That's what we are doing with the Darwinian selection. It's Spencer who screwed up the whole thing and has developed this kind of uh, totally crazy notion of generalized competition as the way to understand the workings of human beings and their societies. So competition is okay. Put it in its place, in its right place, but also put cooperation in its place. So we need to emphasize cooperation. We need to emphasize networking. I could have added we have to de-individualize ourselves a bit and bring ourselves down to the level of a node. That is to say something that's recognizing, recognizably single, but at the same time always and constantly linked to others. And I think if we start doing, going down that route, we have in, in, the hand, in hand the right intellectual tools to reshape a communication system for science. But that is going to be happening only if one thing is done in the institutions where the researchers work. If they are in institutions that are themselves obsessed, either because of the ministries above them or for whatever reason, competition again among private universities or whatever, uh, you, uh, if these institutions uh, succumb to the, the fallacy and the stupidity of the rankings, have you ever seen two rankings that ever coincided? You know, do you know why one university jumps up and down 50, 50 ranks from one year to the next? Is that normal? without anything really happening in that university. No one seems to pay attention to that. No, rank, rank, rank. My university is very funny in this regard. Um, I'm going to be very, very uh, popular with my administration if I continue, but uh, my, my university, when they, they go up two, two levels in some ranking, it's never the same. Immediately, the local rag immediately advertises the fact, we've gone two low levels up. Ah! You know, and everybody is very happy. When we go down 20, of course, no one says anything, you know. And, and uh, you say to yourself, what is the point of this except to induce a general climate of constant comp competition, competition, competition? So as long as we have those rankings hanging up above our institutions, we can be pretty sure that it's going to be very difficult for uh, the researchers to try escaping from that. So maybe that's also where we should, we should start. So in conclusion, we end up with uh, a couple recommendations, I would say. We have to seize back the communication phase of the publishing effort within the researcher communities and their associates, funders, and libraries. I think we have to redesign these things with the help of the money available in the libraries and the funders. And we have to think about all of these efforts, not on the basis of one institution, not on the basis of uh, uh, even a, a region or a country, but by net networking very, very widely. And that goes incidentally also for the institutional repositories for which I could do a parallel development. So that was my message this morning, and I thank you very much. I don't share your perspectives about the librarians because I can observe some more tasks and roles in the academic life for libraries. And on the one hand, I think we have a big responsibility to preserve even digital materials. Uh, this is one point. Uh, I know that is a matter of rights and we have to deal with the big publishers about these rights. But in the end of the day, we have to do this job because the companies are not really appropriate to do this for a longer time. And on the other hand, if we talk about publishers, mostly we talk about the five big publishers of the world. But there are much more publishers who need uh, the support in a way uh, and the delivery of content by the libraries, even on the field of indexing, for example. So I think it is right that we have to be care um, for, uh, about our future role, but if we look at it uh, a little bit more in detail, we found a number of um, very challengeful jobs. <laughs> I am librarian, of course. <laughs> well, I, I fully agree with what you say. I mean, I obviously have caricatured uh, the positions in order to make the contrast as stark as I could and make my thesis more transparent. 
but obviously there are all sorts of details, all sorts of situations, all sorts of, uh, of problems which are much more limited, local and all that, which require exactly this kind of, uh, of attention. My point though is that if librarians disperse themselves on these local problems, the, where they can act and so on, without addressing the very fundamental questions, they ultimately going to, they are going to hit a wall. And it's going to be a very difficult wall to, to, to beat because for example, Digital preservation, I think Cliff could tell us a lot about that. Digital preservation is hell, hell in, uh, in, uh, in, in, to the cube. And, um, and if you're on top of that, you have intellectual property barriers to, to doing the job that you should be doing, uh, then the work becomes you know, like impossible. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not very, very easy to enter this kind of thing. So that's why I was suggesting the publishing phase, which is not a traditional dimension of the libraries, although some now are entering that, but because I think that with funders, libraries and funders can help reintegrate the publishing phase of research within the whole life cycle of research and treat it correctly for once, you know. And you are right also in saying that my, my, uh, my presentation really focused on the big multinational uh, publishers. I said it at the beginning, actually. Uh, but uh, I did that for a very simple uh, reason. They are the ones really shaping the situation right now. And, you know, the way they've been um, looking at open access to the point now that they're trying to, to, to take the stewardship of open access in their way. Look at the way they have managed for many people to confuse gold with APC gold. Most people, when they hear gold, they think it's automatically APC gold. They don't realize that gold never meant that in the beginning. Gold meant simply open access journals. The business models was not even mentioned. Publishers now when they say gold, they mean APC. Yeah. So this kind of evolution among the very big publishers are examples of how they are able to not only adopt the open access motto, but even shape it to their own liking. And that's why I was saying at one point, do we want open access at any cost? Any cost? Yeah. That was my point. Thank you, Jean-Claude. I really like your talk. Um, hearing you and talking about uh, the function of a librarian in this, what we really need to take care of is the skill set of a librarian uh, as to do his job, but also linking students and researchers uh, to the skill set, because that is something I see regularly in my own university and outside of that, is how do you develop a good skill set and give this to students and young researchers to assess this and to uh, go on with this? The same we said um, Tuesday when we were talking about peer review and open peer review. How can we make sure that people, uh, students, researchers detect what's uh, playing here and how they review and uh, develop these skill sets? I think of an important role for librarians is also to do that. And this is probably also what you mean with linking um, the community. Well, I was about to answer you exactly like that, but saying you should even go one step further. It's not just a question of transmitting skill sets. It's to create communities where researchers, librarians, inside the universities or research centers work as a true research community. You have, you have roles to play in identifying and, and, uh, and uh, recovering and distributing knowledge that's relevant for the researchers, which are different from what researchers can do, but they overlap. This is not, a, again, a question of you do this, we do that, and we transmit, you know. It's a question of doing it together in a, in a network thing, and there'll be individuals that will be like intermediaries in this sort of thing. If you manage to create that, the skill sets will migrate naturally because the people will know each other and work together and we will find the need to acquire these skill sets if only to stay in relationship with the people with whom they want to work. So it's a question again of thinking yourself not as competing totally uh, autist, uh, uh, autistic too, but atomistic uh, uh, individuals, but rather as nodes within, within a network and how you can collaborate naturally, because you have to do things and you need help from others, but you can also give help. 
Спасибо. Thank you, John Claude. I really like the uh, um, emphasis that you'd rather see money going into initiatives like eLife, which is in a way owned by academia. And all those libraries that have already started to um, offer publishing services, we find ourselves in a, in a situation that the researchers seem to not trust those publishing services because they think this is just serving vanity publishing. And now I'm starting to ask myself, is it maybe the similar situation that I invest time into pre uh, cre um, preparing our own jam and my daughter thinks the jam from the shop tastes much better because it has the fancy branding on it. So where do we start to crack this mindset and this belief that if academia organizes its own publishing activity, it's not as good and not as valuable as if the commercial players do it? Well, all this is, uh, I think, ultimately, uh, perhaps not completely, but ultimately and partially, therefore, are related to how we create so-called symbolic value in the, in, the, in the research world. Right now, we are caught with essentially one very basic and fundamentally stupid way, which is you are, you are um, respected not by what you write, but by where you write, and which makes very little sense, but that's what people go by. My, it's a tactical advice in this thing, and I've been saying that for many years now, is we should try diluting. You can't confront that frontally uh, in the present historical situation that we live, but we could probably try to dilute these, uh, these modes of evaluation by introducing new modes of evaluation, which are really our own, which are independent of the others, which do not rely on journals. We have to get away from the journal uh, fallacy. There is a journal function, but the journal as a logo is really a fallacy. And, uh, and we should really, really move to, to uh, uh, something, uh, many things different. One of the things I really like, for example, is something like, imagine libraries creating a network to publish. So you have, I don't know, 25, 30 libraries deciding to cooperate to do a, a, a really solid publishing system. Um, you could have, at that point, uh, a, such a network creating something equivalent to the faculty of 1,000. In other words, all the organized e evaluations of the texts themselves, the documents themselves, and bring them out and show, uh, uh, foreground them. All the, the discussions in the first day of this conference around peer review actually were somewhere hovering around these kinds of issues. So if, if things like that are being de developed and there are modes of, of uh, evaluation that are uh, consistently applied to large numbers of papers, it's going to stick. I mean, the, the impact factor did not stick overnight either. It took quite a few years for it to, to become a, the horror that it has become. But the, you can develop much better metrics or much better modes of evaluation, because it doesn't have to be quantitative either, uh, to, to do that. So my, my recommendation is build your, your platforms as networked and as broad as possible, international if possible. And, and in Europe, you're in a beautiful position to do that because you have a legislative framework to be international. It's, uh, it's the beauty of Europe from my, from my Canadian perspective. And, uh, and, uh, and then you, you, you develop uh, ways of creating symbolic value. And then, you know, imagination is at work there. And I would start with something like a faculty of thousand equivalent scheme. Yeah. Claude, thank you very much for that and the questions. We'd like to say a small thank you with a gift for that. And we'd like to thank him once again. For